Design Notes is a show from Google Design about creative work and what it teaches us. Each episode, we'll talk with people from unique creative fields to discover what inspires and unites us in our practice. Hello and welcome to Design Notes. This is a very special episode. Um, I'm your guest host, Aaron Lammer. Uh, I tape these interviews at the SPAN 17 conference in Pittsburgh this fall. Um, This one is with a Pittsburgh local, Nathan Martin, uh, who runs an innovation studio called Deep Local. Uh, What is an innovation studio, I asked him. Uh, He told me uh, they invent things. And uh, some of those inventions are ads, some of them are marketing, some of them are in a nebulous area that I can't really explain. It is very much like a band. It is is punk rock. You know, a a guitarist breaks a string and steps to the side, someone else picks up, you just keep playing. You don't stop. He's done stints in robotics and hacking art, music, uh, now sort of experiential marketing and product invention, but he says that he remains very much the same person uh, he started off as. I think people stay, for the most part, who they were when they were seven years old. I think I'm still, in my core, the same person I was, even when I was that seven years old and I was the punk rocker and and what I am right now. Design Notes is put out by Google Design. You can learn more at design.google slash podcast. That's design.google. There's nothing after the Google. That is the domain uh, slash podcasts. Uh, Here he is, Nathan Martin. Uh, Welcome, Nathan Martin. Thanks. You are the the founder, the proprietor of Deep Local. Uh, What what do you call Deep Local? It's a studio? Uh, I call it an innovation studio. Innovation studio? uh, There's not a really good word to describe us, so it works. Okay, so what is an innovation studio? <laughs> uh, for us, we invent things, uh, things that have never been seen before. Uh, we do it mostly in marketing, but we also work a little bit on the product side for clients. We're ultimately a service company, so uh, most of our inventions and things that we build are for clients like Google. Well, let's let's talk about a project because that'll help yeah. ground us. So yeah. you did this project with balloons. This is unfortunately one that uh, does not go well with audio. <laughs> a, a picture would help solve this better, yeah. but describe the project. self vibration. So, so yeah. uh, it's always good to start. So, um, you know, a lot of our work is really marketing. And what I mean by that is, and I'll describe that project, but it means that we're trying to put things into the world that are exciting and are authentic stories that people get excited about and talk about. So our clients tend to be Fortune 50 uh, brands that want to tell a story about innovation or, you know, just feel like they're in touch with cultural trends as well. So we come up with these ideas and often technology is just a tool that we use uh, to kind of create experiences that are remarkable, that people are going to take notice of, talk about and share. So uh, for Old Navy, uh, a retail client, we were working on a a celebration of, I think it was their 20th birthday, uh, and they wanted to create something. The brief to us, the challenge was create something that celebrates our audience, not us. So we came with, up with this idea on a marketing campaign called that's Selfie Bration. That's a pretty wide open We tend lane. to get yeah. really wide open. I mean, we are the company that gets the wide open briefs, like yeah. make us feel innovative. Globally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with, um, with Selfie Bration, what it really was, well, there is a machine component, but the marketing component was what if we kind of allowed people that already had kind of the selfie trend was in full force. This was a few years back. And we allowed people to kind of create larger than life selfies. And how would we do that in a way that was remarkable? So um, we came up with a display apparatus that we actually hold a patent on now that uses balloons as, as if they were pixels. So uh, almost like halftone images, if you've ever seen them with large and small dots to help create a, a visual image. We do that, but on a really large scale. So we created a modular system, basically a grid of balloons. Each balloon, the air inflation of it's controlled uh, by a, a hy- hydraulic system. Um, so that we can kind of treat them as if they were pixels, making them bigger or smaller in, in real time. And what it allows us to do for a user is a user would send in a picture uh, and hashtag selfiebration. We would pull those images down, moderate them to make sure they weren't profane. And then we would render their image out in near real time uh, out of balloons in, in a matter of seconds, capture a video from that, and then share back with them an, an animated GIF of their image. We installed this as a live event in Times Square in New York for a few days, and then uh, in City Walk, uh, Los Angeles for a few days. It's always connected socially. A lot of the stuff we do in the physical world has some social connection so that a certain number of people can see it in the real world, but we're really doing it for that secondary audience, which is almost our primary audience, which are people who live online who can't see it in, in the real world, but can see the manifestation of it through video or through documentation or remote participation. So I think people listening to this will be familiar with the um, tech, the digital yeah. side of that, which is like, okay, photo comes in, you moderate it, it goes off to a server and Make then it comes thing. up. You get like getting to the raspberry pi that's yeah. on the back of it, I can wrap my head around. <laughs> 
But when you've got to do the balloon part, where do yeah. you get a balloon engineer? Well, that's the fun. That's sometimes um, that's the most fun part of our job is because, yeah, so our, our staff, you know, we're about 60 people and half those staff come from different engineering backgrounds, very diverse backgrounds as well. But robotics, mechanical, electrical yeah. software come out with interact uh, industrial designers, all that kind of stuff happening. But then there's those things outside like you're talking about, like, OK, we need to create balloons. If you think about balloons, interesting challenge because uh, latex isn't designed to be in inflated and deflated, inflated and deflated. There's the physics of, of, of latex just doesn't allow it to do exactly what we wanted to do. It's kind of designed to pop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Inflate it once and that's yeah. it. You, you remember they, they get more stretched out over time. So you can either like correct for that in software and try to figure out, well, what is the, the degradation over time and all that crazy stuff. Um, we ended up going to, uh, we found one of two balloon manufacturers in the US. I think this one was based in Ohio. Um, they have a lead chemist, a chemical engineer who works on the materials. Um, we worked with them to devise a coating based on our needs. So their engineer devised a coating um, that provided more UV protection since we were going to do this outdoor and that would also degrade the material. Uh, and then essentially balloons are made, you, you learn all these interesting things along the way, balloons are made by dipping. They have these forms that dip in latex, they come up, it's why they have a little kind of tip at the bottom of them. So we essentially double dipped balloons. We made them so thick that you couldn't blow them up with your mouth. That's just not possible. So a machine would have to do it, but it allowed them to last for the 24 hours we needed them to last with like very minimal degradation. So that's that's what we did. And then you also, I assume, had to figure out a way how to blow up that double thick balloon. Yeah, Seems yeah. Seems like a, another challenge that I don't know who yeah. you would hire and, for. And <laughs> those are the problems that excite the engineers that work at Deep Local because once you kind of figure out the idea, which is it's pretty difficult to get there, but once we get to an idea, our client gets excited about it and they buy into the, the concept that, yeah, this is going to get excited. People are going to talk about this. It sounds good. We do it all. So we're developing the launch strategy, the partnership, all the marketing side of it. But then there's all the engineering challenges as well. And for the most part, our clients just assume we can figure it out. And we do that too. We assume we can figure it out. As long yeah. as I have figured out people um, that are excited by that and problem solvers, then, uh, then we will. The kind of um, marketing you're describing, which I'll just call like loosely experiential yeah, marketing, yeah. it can feel gimmicky sure. and stunty. And part of what really unified a lot of the projects and why I find a lot of stuff that you do at Deep Local fascinating is it feels like it could fail. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And that live wire element of the possibility of failure can kind of elevate it to a more art-like state. Mm -hmm. um, that's a quality I identify with art I like. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you go see a band play live, they could fail. Yeah. You're not listening to a recording. You're listening to people who are either going to succeed or fail. So how do you look at failure or at yeah. least the specter of failure at Deep Local? Well, first, I, I, I love that observation. I actually haven't had anyone uh, give me that observation before, and it, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, I think about – we think a lot about the stuff that we do. It is all kind of uh, – on that edge, um, because it's it's we have a fixed budget, a fixed timeline, and the thing I always tell the engineers we have is we don't have the chance to go back and say I need another week or I'm a little right. behind that deadline. And and uh, you think about a lot of our our clients that that do employ engineers, they those deadlines often get pushed. Our deadline never gets pushed. So what that means is you have to have an extreme ability to adapt your problem solving along the way because we're going to hit unknowns. We we never know everything when we start. We know pieces of like, yes, we think based on past experience, this is how it's going to work. We think that we can figure this out. But along the way, there's going to be variables. It may be a variable caused by, um, you know, hey, hey, that LED that we need 16,000 of is discontinued and there's only 12,000 and we better figure out what we're going to do. You know, or it could be, it could be about sourcing or it could be about um, just technical challenge where something doesn't behave the way we thought it would behave or the user experience isn't good. So you have to course correct like every year. You're kind of like constantly solving problems. I think about failure a lot. Like we, we don't fail because we control what success is, to be honest. I, I think what that means is that as long as we have really good communication, there are a lot of ways to correct uh, a problem in the, midst, in the middle of a, of a work stream. So because we have these different pieces of the company, we can say, hey, if we're struggling in software to solve a problem, maybe hardware can do some more heavy lifting. Hey, if we're struggling in both of those, maybe we hire a human to sit and do something that we, can't, we don't have time to program. It's because things live for a short period of time as well. Uh, most of our work lives for a short period of time. Some lives uh, longer. But the short period of time work, we have that freedom to say, as long as we know what the problem is, the people are talking and not just doing their piece of the work, you never get to a point where it just you plug it together and it doesn't work. And I think that that's um, a willingness that we that we take that is very much like a band. It is it is punk rock. You know, a, a guitarist breaks a string, except for the side, someone else picks up. You just keep playing. You don't stop. We never stop playing. And I think that that is uh, 
it's really hard to fake authenticity. And I think in marketing, often people try to fake authentic stories. And I think that you know, audiences are pretty aware of, uh, and we're seeing this in, in you know, recent ads have been criticized um, you know, by Pepsi and Kendall Jenner and stuff. like. It's, it's hard to fake an authentic story, and it's increasingly hard to do that with a, a really well-connected universe that we live in. It's rare that an authentic story will have the word authentic attached yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you just do it. And yeah. I think that that's what's... And that's why we are, we're very much like come into the kitchen, see what we do, because we have nothing to hide. And you'll find in, in, in advertising, the world that we entered, because um, you know, we didn't start there, what we saw is there are so many different businesses that what's happened over the years is they have focused on their slices. And in, in that industry, there's, what's, there's the advertising agency, which will do creative, and there's a production company that produces stuff. And they've, they've divided themselves over the years because they figured out where they can make money. And, there's, and production, making stuff, has risk. So why not leave that up to three people who can go bid on it and put all the risk on them, yell at them if they're not done on time? We've collapsed that back to probably where it started, which is we come up with the ideas, we're beholden to the user experience. Our success you know, is measured in marketing language, but we're doing engineering, so we have to succeed at that too. But by collapsing it, we have total control, and that allows us to, to behave like a rock band. The people that you've cited as people you work with and mm -hmm. collaborate with have a very Pittsburgh flavor, yeah. you know, um, there's uh, some people who can do some machine shop, yep. uh, some people who can manipulate the robot arm, yeah. and some people who can write the um, firmware for yep. the robot, yeah. robot arm. For one person, yourself, um, who has a pretty varied background, yeah. but how do you evaluate new employees and people to work on these projects yeah. when... I can't imagine you are like both an expert welder and uh, hacker yourself. So when you're like bringing in someone yeah. who's in a discipline that you're like, I don't know the first thing about this discipline. Yeah. I got to decide whether to trust you yeah. on a sprint. What do yeah. you look for? It makes me think a lot about when I, so I used to teach and I was a horrible teacher because I'm not a super patient person and I hated teaching technology. Uh, I remember I taught a class once and it was supposed to be on flash and I, and I think a student went and complained to the director because I said on kind of day one, I know I have this curriculum, but I think you need to learn Flash on your own. And I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> design um, because I really do believe I, I don't put huge stock in specific technical skills. I think that it's about personality more than anything else and, and, and who a person is. Now, there's definitely a technical competency level, but the people that thrive at, at working with me are people who um, want to learn who uh, want to be challenged, who uh, are okay with a subjective goal. I mean, which a big problem for engineers is, you know, how, that subjectivity of there is not a clear right. We're figuring out what correct is along the way. Um, and that's difficult because marketing is subjective. There's no guarantee that the thing we're putting in the world is going to get talked about on Good Morning America. We can, we can use our best judgment and kind of uh, the things that we've learned to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best position. There's no guarantee. So what I've learned uh, is that we, as a team, what we did uh, a couple of years ago is we started to develop these kind of core values. And we have, I think, five that we, that we pay attention to. Uh, efficiency became key. Can I get things done uh, you know, in a quick way? resourcefulness, which is, hey, I'm not going to be given every, you know, every, every piece of technology I maybe need. I have what I have. Let me figure it out with what I got. You know, authenticity was important to us. And all these things kind of evolved as well as understanding over the years who, who didn't work and why didn't they work. And we right. start to kind of uh, reverse engineer it and say, you know, the things that don't work well are big egos. Someone comes in and, and they're better than everyone else. They know better. I want confidence, but I don't want an ego. So you know, people that walk in on day one and say, well, that's not how it's done. At my last job, we did it this way, or you need to do this, or you should do this. There is no should for us because we're, we're in uncharted territory. So we need to figure out what works best for us. I've heard it described that in things like marketing, mm -hmm. basically you want to figure out how to do something once and sell it to nine other people mm -hmm. and do it exactly the same way. And the first one was expensive and the next nine are cheap. That sounds it, nice. It <laughs> doesn't sound like you ever get to sell the next nine. No, not typically. Um, and I, I, you know, I, don't, I, I don't know. We go back and forth whether that's good or bad. You know, I, I, I don't have a, a firm take on that. I mean, definitely a lot of the work that we've done for Google in the last few years uh, ends up being um, recreated or traveling to different events. And, and sure. they've, they've been good about that. I think then our clients see the benefit, uh, a residual benefit of using this work over and over again. You know, for example, we worked on the Chelsea location of Google's headquarters. And in the lobby area, there's a wall of about 6,000 arcade style buttons, old school arcade buttons. These are all custom behind them are custom circuit boards, uh, all modular as well, that, that have light pipes that go to these buttons. And basically it acts like a low resolution touchscreen. So you can interact with it by touching the buttons, rolling your body against it, throwing your hands against it, or it can be 
be a display of 16 million colors in super low resolution. And then we build a software platform behind that so that uh, developers and artists can program for it the same way they program for the Chrome browser. So it's super simple, can be fresh. And what we did after we did that is the installation is we built a version of that was more modular that's now traveled to like the Mobile World Congress event and traveling some other Google events. So for us, um, there is benefit to reusability. I, I think I always struggle with it because I'm a person and a lot of our staff are people who like that initial challenge. It would sometimes be nice to have a chance to take another crack at it. I think that's where we always feel like if we, if that first time you're always kind of figuring it out and if you ever had a check, second chance to do it again, you do things a little bit differently. We never usually get that second chance. But as a business, our whole brand and our identity is really built on being the first, doing something that's never been seen before. This is not what you started out doing. This no. is not the career you envisioned <laughs> at high school graduation. Yeah, yeah. What were you doing before? It's funny you said, I always say that myself, that I'm not doing anything that I thought I would ever be doing. But it's funny because my wife also works at Deep Local as our CMO, and she went to school for, for marketing. And she says that, in her opinion, I'm doing exactly what I, what I was trained to do because so I went to college at Carnegie Mellon for basically robotic art, but I, I did a lot of interactive installation work. I was self-taught, so I would learn um, software engineering. I'd learn a little bit about hardware. I, I, this will date me, like parallel port control. And I worked in uh, uh, lingo, like Macromedia Director, to try to control stuff. And, and you kind of work, but at that time, there was no... Um, there was, there was no plan to do that to make money, like definitely. It was, yeah. it was about how much am I going to spend on this thing. And, and I made art for myself. And, and there is a difference between art and what we do. I, I realize that. But, but I do think that what I really loved was I started to collaborate with people in different disciplines that had skills that I didn't have. I realized really quickly in college that the things that were in my head that I wanted to build, I couldn't do on my own. I wasn't learning fast enough. I was good at managing, kind of like figuring it out together holistically at a high yeah. level. And then I needed expertise to help pull it off. And I needed the experiences that were different than mine coming from different backgrounds to make the idea better. So I always collaborated. And, um, and I ran a band for a long time around the same period. And I was- Was that before or after college? It was around the same around time. Around the same yeah. time, yeah. My band started when I was 16 years old. It changed a few times, but the last kind of version of it lasted for about a decade was, was throughout college. So at the same time I had an art group, I had a band. And I was, again, a no talent. I mean, I, I feel like a little bit- uh, like I am now as a CEO, like I can't do the stuff that my team can do. Just like when I was in a band, the musicians that worked with me um, were much more talented than me. And they yeah. went on to prove that and be in other bands and, and do well for themselves. But for me, I was good at organizing them, at motivating them, at planning the tours, at building the relationships, at doing the graphic design for our records and, and working on the record deals. Like I did all of that. And then kind of singing in the band, which is what I did screaming more so was uh was almost like secondary. I was like a, a manager. And I feel like that's what I am right now. I'm at Deep Local. My job is to, to steer the ship, uh, to make sure I have the right people there, that they're excited and motivated, and I have the right challenges for them to keep them motivated as well. What was that moment like at the end of the time? Like you're, mm -hmm. you're in like a punk band. Yeah. You're probably not going to like do that while you're uh, a CEO. Yeah. What was that period of your life yeah. like to, to transition <laughs> so sharply? It feels it, it's interesting because I'm reconnecting with some of my old bandmates now. Uh, recently, actually, I uh, was just texting with one before I walked in here and um, sharing an old photo that our drummer sent me. And, it, and I was thinking I've been thinking a lot back. I mean, I'm 40 years old now, so I think a lot uh, now about, you know, my 20s and what they were like and what's different and what's the same. And I think um it is funny sometimes when I think about what I do and that I'm marketing brands. Like when I think about that, like I, I come up with marketing for big brands and I used to be more of a political activist. And I think I always have, uh, I think people stay for the most part who they were when they were seven years old, I think persists. And I think I'm still in my core, the same person I was even when I was that seven years old when I was the punk rocker and what, and what I am right now. I think I'm, um, I don't, I question authority. I don't like to be conventional. I don't like conventional wisdom. I don't like being told that's the way you do things. That's just how it's done. I like to reinvent, you know, and I always have that perspective of just, I want to be doing something interesting and different. Now the context is totally different. So when I think about back then, you know, my, my band was, uh, talked a lot about technology. We were even different in that world because we would uh, play shows and then we would do like hacker workshops. And I ran a, my art collective was called Hacktivist. And we would talk about how to reverse engineer technology and how to uh, gain access to mainstream media. And I was, um, did projects that, that landed me in some hot water with uh, the law a few times. And, and I think it, it was contestational, but it was always, uh, and it was, and a lot of it was more political, 
but I always kind of like to, to stir things up, to get people to notice things. Like to me, art, my vision of art is that artists see the world or whatever thing that might be. It could be a flower on the street, it could be a piece of music. They see things in a different way and their job is to then communicate that perception, that experience to someone else. How can you see the world and look at it differently? And why I was a, a somewhat political artist because I was looking at things that were, you know, oftentimes critical of advertising and saying, if you just step back and observe, let me try to show you this thing that you're not noticing. Um, so things like Washington Mutual Bank used to do marketing with Che Guevara's image to advertise low finance charge checking accounts. And I was like, you can walk by that every day on a billboard and never notice the absurdity of it, or you can kind of reflect on it. And I think artists' jobs are to not tell us what to think, but to get us to, to think for ourselves about the, the things that we take for granted around us. And I think I've, I've you know, while, while I don't believe what I'm doing is uh, a greater service to the world, the service that I've, I've reconciled my, for myself that I feel like I'm, I'm doing is I'm trying to create a, a, a place uh, in Deep Local for employees. And I want to create a space where we are free to solve problems, be creative, be proud of our work, put things in the world that we get the credit for. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that. If I, if I can kind of carve that space of a business that I don't think anyone else has created, that's what I'm most proud of, as long as I can kind of keep that going and keep a quality of life while, while doing it. Well, uh, thank you very much, Nathan Martin. Hey, thanks so much. So I'm Aaron Lammer. I'm the guest host for these special episodes from SPAN 2017 in Pittsburgh. But this show is actually a normal show that comes out with a regular host, and his name is Liam Spradlin. Hey, Liam. Yep, that's me. Uh, Liam, what, um, what was your inspiration for Design Notes? So I'm a big believer that talking to people from other creative disciplines really feeds into my own creativity. Yeah. So the ulterior motive is really that I'm just interested from hearing from people working on different stuff. Yeah, I like I checked out the, the first episode and you've got some people who have a background in architecture talking about what that brings to their design practice. Is that is that the kind of stuff you like to get into? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we like to look at kind of the commonalities running through all design work and the different ways we approach them in each discipline. You can find design notes at design.google slash podcasts. You can also subscribe to the newsletter at design.google slash subscribe. We have four episodes, four special episodes from SPAN 2017 in Pittsburgh. I hope you'll check them out and thank you for listening.